have a special guest who is who has got up early in the morning for uh, for this sessions. Um, so I have Madison uh, who is with me today. Uh, he is joining us all the way from United States. Um, so he's going to talk today about effective ML. Uh, Madison, over to you. Sounds good. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I think the the title of this talk was originally intended to be effective ML models. I've made a slight change because I think, uh, in fact, I'm going to be talking a little bit less about uh, the models and more about the systems that the models exist in. So uh, more about everything surrounding the models um, and how models are used in a production setting. So hopefully this is interesting. Hopefully I'm coherent as it is quite early in the morning and I'm still working through my morning coffee. Um, but yeah, I think it should be a good time. So thank you all for coming. I guess as a bit of expectation setting, just to give you some background on, um, I guess, my training data points, if you will. Um, I like to say that everyone should decide for themselves whether or not um, my training data will generalize to your problem. So I think it's worth being skeptical of, uh, of the opinions of someone you're going to listen to. So uh, I was a college dropout from Olin College of Engineering, founded a company with some friends, um, and was initially on the engineering side of the business. I've since moved to the ML side of the business, but have taken many of kind of the things I learned working as an engineer um, with me. And this is based on largely my personal experiences at Indico. I'm going to focus largely on the people and the communication interface between human and model rather than the models themselves. It's going to be one part extended rant and one part idea sample platter. So um, there's not necessarily going to be a, a great overall arc, but what I'm looking for is just to give people interesting uh, tidbits, interesting ideas that they can take and use in their own applications. Just want to like, I guess, uh, jumpstart interesting ideas in your own head. Uh, in terms of Indica's problem framing, I think this is just, again, useful in terms of uh, where my experiences come from. We are looking to make existing manual processes, um, primarily focused around documents, more efficient through the use of ML. I mean, importantly, we want to empower business users, someone without prior data science expertise, to manage ML processes and uh, design, their, design and build their own custom machine learning models from start to finish. Um, so we're really looking to optimize for limiting labor, labeler time. And we have this constraint that our model architecture is basically fixed. We're not going to be doing feature engineering. We're not going to be switching out the base model architecture for a machine learning problem. Um, that's taken as a given. Um, so these design constraints are pretty interesting because it means the one thing we can change is training data. And uh, data site curation becomes a very important uh, problem in this setting. And just in terms of the kind of documents we work on, we work on things like invoices, contracts, insurance claims, and securities documents. So everything from very short form data to longer form documents where you might have to hunt through the document to find the right answer. Again, just a bit of, of context of where my opinions are coming from. And the interface looks something like this. Um, so it looks quite a lot like any other data entry application with the uh, caveat that we're providing machine learning driven suggestions. Um, and these, these fields you see on the right hand side, these are user defined. So again, that's kind of one of the uh, unique things about our problem where we are allowing our end users to define the problem um, with a little bit of hand holding to make sure that they, they understand how to frame an effective machine learning problem. Um, so we end up running into quite a few fun problems uh, by virtue of, of working with folks who've not really been exposed to data science before. And I'm sure we'll talk through a couple of those uh, in the duration of this talk. Finally, uh, as a quick overview, we're going to talk about data curation first, then about something I like to call learning versus specification, some options for moving past simple labeled examples, some production ML pain points, and finally, some of the unique affordances of working in a production setting um, that you might not get in an academic setting. So without further ado, let's talk about data site curation. Um, and I think this is uniquely important right now um, 
because of a couple factors. One is a pre-trained model for just about everything. So you can look to ResNet for, for image processing applications. You can look to BERT or one of the many BERT variants for natural language processing applications. Um, these are good general pre-trained models that are a decent starting point for just about any problem in these domains. And they're not going to be perfect, but they're going to be good enough. Um, also importantly, fine tuning works well across many ML domains. And uh, often a few hundred labels, maybe uh, at worst about a thousand labels, will lead to a useful machine learning model. So the primary barrier to entry, the primary barrier to just um, getting an effective machine learning model is building a small label data, uh, label data set. But labeling even a few hundred data points takes time. Um, it's hard to convince subject matter experts to label data, uh, especially outside of the environment that they're normally used to operating in. And we really want to focus on making that data set construction process as painless as possible and making sure that each data point we do ask a subject matter expert to label is actually valuable to building a better machine learning model. We very much want to support an iterative development process. So um, production ML, I don't think, should look like creating a static data set and then iterating on model parameters until you, you get something um, that's up to par. I think that's a very unrealistic setting. Uh, oftentimes, you start with a, a small data set, let's say 200 labeled examples, and you're seeking out informative examples to improve the quality of your machine learning model. You're not messing with input features. You're not messing with base model architectures. Um, so it's really this, this data set curation process that has value. I would also say that importantly, you don't need to solve 100% of a problem to deliver business value. And I think a lot of people don't really think about this fact that manual fallback is uh, quite frequently necessary for hard problems. And it should be something that we plan around and we, uh, we intend to support rather than kind of falling back to as a, uh, you know, uh, we couldn't quite solve this problem, we'll have to use manual fallback. That should be the expectation going into a machine learning project is that there will be manual fallback required and you should design around uh, supporting that process and making that process effective. So this is kind of the, the rough development process that we share with our customers, where we start with an initial model trained on about 200 labeled data sets. We give them tools to identify common failure modes, and then we give them tools to shore up those failure modes with additional label training data. And with the expectation that we'll never get to 100%, but that getting to an 80% solution can still be tremendously value, valuable. Um, an 80% solution might mean difference between a task taking uh, a minute and taking 15 seconds. And that can still be uh, have massive business impact. One analogy I like to use is this uh, analogy of a student and a teacher. So in this scenario, the student is the machine learning model and the teacher is the human providing the label training data for that model. And importantly, the student is only as good as the teacher. Um, oddly, it seems like academia has like, been laser focused on the student. We are looking to build better and better machine learning models that can infer from um, in, infer patterns from messier and messier data, fewer data points. But really, maybe the best option is to find better ways for us as teachers to convey the knowledge that we have stored in our brains. We spend comparatively little time thinking about how we can provide better instructional material, better course material. Uh, I guess I would distinguish this from like curriculum learning where we're, we're trying to find an automated schedule to um, supervise a machine learning model as best as possible. Um, this is more about um, just enabling better communication interfaces between person and machine learning model. Um, and this is kind of one of my favorite papers in the past few years around this space called Machine Teaching, a New Paradigm for Building Machine Learning Systems. So it's a bit buzzwordy, but um, I think it is a useful concept. Um, and I'm glad that someone cares, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> um, so 
This machine teaching paper focuses a lot on analogies between traditional programming and machine learning or machine teaching. And they also really focus on this idea of an iterative development process. Um, in programming, we're inspecting error modes, we're editing code, we're compiling and we're testing. And there's a very similar process happening on the machine learning side where we're looking for error modes, deciding if we need to edit or add knowledge. Here they're focusing on uh, labels or features, but you might also add data points or add uh, label classes. Uh, yes, we'll absolutely be sharing the session recordings or PowerPoint afterwards. Uh, maybe both, actually. And finally, we're uh, training a model again and testing and seeing whether or not those error modes persist. So this, this loop looks very similar to the loop we see in a programming setting. But we talk comparatively little about this loop uh, in the machine learning community. And the, the core concept here is that this machine teaching research aims at making the teacher more productive at building machine learning models, rather than building machine learning models that are more productive from learning from small amounts of label data. Here's kind of another useful analogy between programming and machine teaching that I thought was interesting. Um, so I'm not sure I agree with every single one of these, these analogs. Um, but one that I did think was apt was this compiler and ML algorithm uh, analogy, uh, or even framework and uh, frameworks versus ImageNet, word to vect BERT, et cetera. And I think the key thing here is that as an academic community, we're all looking at compilers. We're all looking at compilers and frameworks. Uh, similar to the way where basically every programmer has an interest in building better tooling for themselves. We have an interest in building better tooling for ourselves through uh, better base models, better ML algorithms. Everyone uh, in the machine learning community is fascinated with this. But there's comparatively little time spent on, you know, perhaps it's the boring stuff, but development processes. So on the programming side, this is specs, unit testing, deployment, monitoring. Um, and on the machine learning side, this is data collection, testing, publishing. And really that last step is uh, where people spend most of their time on the programming side. Um, and it's where we should expect to spend most of our time on the machine learning side as well. So it's kind of a shame that comparatively little effort is put into uh, formalizing good best practices. Here's kind of another important point. Um, this is straight from the paper. It is within the ranks of the domain experts where we will find the large population of machine teachers that will increase by orders of magnitude the number of ML models used to solve problems. Very few people are compiler engineers on the software side. Um, yet we kind of paint this picture of the equivalent of a compiler engineer um, being the person your organization needs to employ if you want to do machine learning in production. And I think that's kind of inaccurate. I don't think we should be aiming for every company to hire compiler engineers. <laughs> Instead, we should be aiming to enable domain experts to build custom machine learning models effectively. And it looks very different. Uh, and the other real benefit here is that there are relatively few machine learning experts who understand um, theory, who understand machine learning models at a very deep mathematical level. Um, many more data scientists and analysts and even more domain experts. So if we can enable domain experts to productively communicate with machine learning models, there's massive value possible. So I guess we've been, we've been talking in a bit of an abstract sense so far. Let's get really concrete about the kinds of things we've done at Indico um, and the kinds of things I'd like to see more companies do to enable this uh, iterative development process. A lot of this looks uh, like active learning, if you're familiar with active learning, but I would say that there are some key distinctions. Um, most notably, this is not an entirely automatic process. This is all driven by uh, a human making an observation and taking an action. And I think that's actually uh, 
an important difference. In an active learning setting, we are relying on some heuristic to be uh, better than random sampling for generating the next, uh, for deciding which example should be labeled next. Here, we are allowing a human to make a determination of where more data is needed, what error modes are problematic, and giving them some tools, giving them a toolbox to find the unlabeled examples or find the mislabeled examples that would most effectively correct for that error. Um, and I think that means you can, you know, the process as a whole is more effective. So first off, something really simple, searching for mislabeled examples. Uh, very often, you can trace a production error mode, an ML bug, if you will, back to an error in the ground truth data. Um, recently, I went back and uh, found in my data set, uh, we typically work on like sequence labeling style problems like named entity recognition, information extraction. I found one particular labeled example where the entire document had been highlighted as a named entity. Um, and this was driving the source of some some rough predictions that we were getting out of our model. So searching for mislabeled examples can be an effective way to correct for error modes. Um, how do we automatically float mislabeled examples to the top? Well, quite simply, you look for examples where the prediction differs quite a lot from the ground truth. Um, and obviously in some cases, this is going to show you legitimately mispredicted examples. But in other cases, it's going to show you scenarios where your model has been more effective than your, your ground truth. So in this example here, we have a photo of a dog that's been labeled as a cat. Um, and we see that our model has correctly captured that it's a dog by learning from other training examples. And we know to prioritize going back in and relabeling this example. Another option is seeking out examples your model is uncertain about. So areas where there's a lot of uh, uncertainty where there's a pretty even spread of probability between classes. These examples might also be informative um, because your model needs some help to uh, make a confident prediction on one of these classes. And uh, sometimes you do this via measuring the entropy of the probability distribution, but you can also do some simpler things like just looking for examples where the probability of the maximum uh, the highest class is lowest. So it's another proxy for examples where the probability distribution is very evenly spread or where there are what I like to call high probability alternatives. So the difference between your highest confidence and your second highest confidence class is small. Both of those are indicators that you can benefit from more training data that looks similar to these examples. Uh, yeah, and in this case, you can actually directly do this without labels. So we have, in this case, we're not assuming any labeled data. We're just looking at the probability distributions over unlabeled data. So the hope is you have much more unlabeled data than you have labeled data. It's not always true, but it's sometimes true. Another option is using your model to seek out rare classes. So um, you may only find five instances of some class of interest, but you know there are many more present somewhere hidden away in your labeled, your unlabeled training data. You can actually use your, your poor quality model to float likely instances of the rare class to the top. And again, it's going to be noisy by sorting and searching and ranking. We can more easily find other instances of this data. Um, so here I'm just kind of, this is intended to represent a, uh, a distribution. Here we have uh, examples where the class of interest is assigned zero probability on the left. On the other end, we have instances where that class is assigned 1.0 probability. So as you can see, most items aren't relevant. Uh, most items don't belong to the class of interest, but there's a long tail that might, that you can search through in a relatively efficient way. You can also use metadata to find more informative examples. You might have prior information that um, some metadata is associated with strange behavior in your data. So um, one real world example, we process mortgages um, for a large company. 
And some particular counties in the US follow different practices that uh, might be quite different from other, other counties follow. So just that simple information about the county of origination for that document allows us to pull out examples that might be more beneficial to add to our machine learning models um, because we know they're aberrational, because we know they're weird. Um, and we need to handle them well in order to, to meet some uh, minimum accuracy. You also might have in like an image processing scenario, simple statistics about how dark or how light or how blurry an image is. Um, you can also leverage these to find more difficult to process than average examples. Uh, and finally, you can seek out, it's not quite finally, you can seek out semantically similar examples to uh, examples of interest to help improve the weaknesses of the model. So if you're looking through your false positives or your false negatives, and you realize that there are particular settings that your model isn't performing well in, you can look for data that looks similar to shore up that specific data mode. Um, so this is in contrast to a, a class that's being handled poorly. We're looking for data modalities, data uh, that are commonly missed. And finally, just kind of one cool efficiency trick, um, something I'd like to see more benefit from, but this concept of using a dimensionality reduction technique or like a, uh, a data layout technique for bulk labeling. So it might be that your classes of interest are represented well by your uh, vector space that you're working in, like let's say contextual BERT embeddings. And when uh, your model already has some good prior, uh, some features that are picking out these differences well, you might find that your classes of interest separate nicely in some 2D layout, like TCN or UMAP. So you can highlight a cluster of examples and very quickly label in bulk just by checking an example as being representative of a class of interest or not, and submit those labels uh, as a chunk. And this might be a little bit cognitively easier than going example by example, because um, you're looking at a bunch of things that all should be of the same type at once, um, and you can label more quickly. So I think this is also an underexplored area, just simple visualization, simple tools to make the labeling process more efficient. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the two ways you can speed up the labeling process are either making labeling each data point faster or by finding more informative data points. Uh, and finally, I think this is one thing people um, may not consider you might want to consider changing your label schema if everything is going poorly. It might just be that your problem has been framed in a way uh, that's making it more difficult than it should be for the machine learning model to learn the relevant patterns. Um, we like to say you always learn something by looking at your data. We're always setting up label schemas, uh, like the set of labels we care about ahead of time, labeling data, learning that some assumption we had about how our data looked is wrong through the process of simply putting eyeballs on data and then making changes and modifying your label schema to do it better the next time around. Um, and I think tools for data labeling should also support this process. Um, you always learn something, so why is it so hard to go back and make a, a label change like um, combining two labels or splitting a single label out into two different categories? We should build tools to make these kind of corrections more efficient when they come up. Um, because it's, the, it's not really the exception, I think it's the rule that um, label, chain, label schema changes are necessary to get a good machine learning model out the other end. Um, one specific example here, we process things like invoices. You might see uh, a due date referenced as something like next Tuesday. And if we were to pull out next Tuesday, that's not sufficient information for us to uh, store the due date in a database somewhere. We might need a reference date or a reference offset label to handle this case effectively. So you learn things like this when you, you look at your data through the labeling process.
I guess uh, I think I'm going to take a quick break here and uh, turn it over to Andre Karpathy just for a couple moments. Um, this is from a 2020 conference called Scaled ML. And I think it embodies a lot of the concepts I've talked about so far. Um, and it's interesting to see how some of these practices have been implemented at Tesla. So uh, Andre Karpathy, I think, is kind of integral to this entire machine teaching movement. movement. Um, and I think it's some of it may just be rooted in his initial uh, idea of this software 2.0. So as machine learning matures, what do the tools that we use to interact with machine learning models look like? Uh, how do we chain machine learning models together? How do we build full systems that involve machine learning components? So uh, I think this is an awesome example. Hopefully you do as well. And let me actually just stop screen sharing and make sure the audio is going to come through. OK. Lanes, we're injecting stop sign over there, stop line, road markings, we're putting keyboards around cars, traffic lights, road edges and curbs, uh, even things like trash bins coming up over there. Uh, lines that make up the intersection. In a bit, there's lines that create. See, I'm just going to skip ahead. And so basically, there's a massive variety of even just for a stop sign to get this to work. And what we do day to day in the team is we are going through the long tail and we're building all this infrastructure for sourcing all these additional examples. And so I've shown in the Autonomy Day presentation earlier last year the data engine, the process by which we um, iteratively apply active learning to source examples in cases where uh, the detector is misbehaving. And then we source examples in those and we label them and incorporate them into part of a training set. So for stop sign detection, as an example, we have a uh, approximate detector for stop signs based on an initial seed set of data. And we run that and deploy that to cars in shadow mode. And then you can detect some kind of a lack of health of that detector at test time. So for example, the stop sign detection is flickering. That could be a, a source of in, um, sort of um, uh, uncertainty. You can also detect that the neural network is uncertain in a certain Bayesian way, and there's a few ways to, to model that. Uh, you can uh, find instances where you get surprised to see a stop sign. Like, why didn't you see it when you were a bit further away? Um, you can also source examples when we detect a stop sign, but the map thinks that there should be no stop sign, or vice versa. So it's sort of a map vision disagreement. So we have lots of different ways uh, of sourcing uh, difficult cases. And then we upload images, and we look through them, we label some of them, and incorporate them into a training set. Um, as an example, we've struggled with these heavily occluded stop signs. We found that the detector was not performing very well when they were heavily occluded. And then we have a mechanism in this data engine process where we can actually train these kinds of detectors offline. So we can train a small detector that detects an occluded stop sign by trees. And then what we do with that detector is that we can beam it down to the fleet and we can ask the fleet, please apply this detector on top of everything else you're doing. And if the, this detector scores high, then please send us an image. And then the fleet responds with a somewhat noisy set, but they boost the amount of examples we have of stop signs that are occluded. And maybe 10% of them are actual occluded stop signs that we get from that stream. And this requires no firmware upgrade. This is completely dynamic and can just be done by the team extremely quickly. Is the bread and butter of how we actually get any of these tasks to work. It's just accumulating these large data sets in the full tail of that distribution. So we have tens of thousands of occluded stop signs. Uh, the fleet can send us as many as it takes. Uh, we have the biggest data set for except right turn on stops. I'm basically certain of that. <laughs> um, we again create a detector for this, and then we get a noisy stream from the fleet of uh, cars encountering uh, except right turn on stops, and then we can label that, incorporate into training set. We have tens of thousands of these. I'm not actually 100% sure how you build out a data set like this without the fleet. <clears throat> so I've talked a lot about. Yeah, so I think the, the key principles he's talking about here are exactly the same as what I've just gone through. So they're building out processes to source the most informative data points, um, even in production. And uh, I think it's kind of fascinating because I, when I first got into ML, I had this impression, I had this misconception that um, you, know, you, you just built a data set and you fed it into a machine learning model and you pressed the button and it worked. But in fact, we're finding that as we build systems that are reliable in production settings, it really does require partitioning the problem into small chunks and handling each chunk kind of meticulously, um, exhaustively, to get this to be something that we can truly trust and truly rely on.
I guess that's all I'll talk about data set curation for now. Um, and I figured I'd talk a little bit about learning and specification. So here is an example to kind of illustrate the, the specification problem. We have a couple numbers on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have a target, uh, one hot encoded target. So if you just stare at this for a couple seconds, I'll give you a moment to infer what you think the pattern is. It shouldn't take very long. And probably a lot of you are thinking, OK, yeah, this looks pretty simple. Uh, it looks like we're classifying uh, all odd examples as 1, 0, and all even examples as 0, 1. But it's hard to draw inferences, to make inferences from small data sets. And in fact, there are many different patterns that are all equally good descriptors of this small data set. So it might be, yes, these are all odd numbers, um, but these are also primes. These are also numbers belonging to the set 3, 5, 7. We really don't know because we are only communicating through this one hot label. Um, this one hot label gives us a bit of information, per example. Um, I find this kind of mind blowing. What, like this is such a low bandwidth interface to communicate with a machine learning model. Why don't we look for better ways to, to get more information per, per unit time uh, out of our labelers? And uh, yeah, so rather than focusing on this problem of how do we efficiently find patterns that explain our data, why don't we focus on this problem of how do we efficiently communicate the tasks we want solved? Um, because a machine learning model might find a perfectly valid pattern in this data, but it might not be the pattern we want. Um, and if it seems like this example is kind of contrived, sure, this particular example is contrived, but this happens all the time in practice as well. And it's uh, perhaps even more problematic in a setting where um, you're, for instance, trying to classify a long document. And many terms happen to co-occur with a uh, given doc type, but only some are causal. And others are artifacts of how you sampled or artifacts of uh, your, your training distribution, but not necessarily your, your production data distribution. This is also related to this Clever Hans effect um, that you might have seen. Um, Clever Hans is one of my favorite examples. Um, interesting. Is everyone else uh, seeing the slides update or not? Let me try unsharing and resharing. Cool. This should be better. Sorry about that. Did folks see um, this example earlier or no? Thank you, Michael. This is what I was referring to when I was talking about um, inferring whether or not this given sequence is, you know, OK, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just give people a moment to stare at this. Uh, this is my example for odd numbers versus primes versus numbers in the set 357. So this is also very related to this Clever Hans effect. Um, Clever Hans was a horse, I'm going to say, in the early 1900s, um, where the general public was convinced that this horse was capable of basic mathematics. Um, and the horse would be shown simple math problems, let's say single digit addition, and it would stomp its hoof a certain number of times, and it would stop on the correct number. And the crowd was just blown away. Um, but it turns out, as you might expect, as far as we know, horses are not capable of single digit addition. Um, and the horse was paying attention to subtle cues from its handler to decide when to stop stomping. Um, and it's not actually known whether or not this was intentional on the part of the handler, or whether the handler was just as blown away um, and was unintentionally communicating uh, his expectations to the horse uh, without realizing it. So in a similar way, machine learning models often pick up on signals that we don't intend them to. Um, and it can make it seem like 
a machine learning model is capable or uh, is, is solving a task that we want it to, where in fact it's relying on some uh, high level statistics or some other, other signal that's only correlated with the task of interest, but not actually causal. Um, so if you haven't already, I would really encourage folks to read uh, the Gradient Pub's NLP's Clever Hans moment has arrived. It's an absolutely brilliant read. And it talks about uh, ways in which BERT exhibits this phenomenon. Uh, here's you know, another example of something that we might call a spurious correlation, uh, where the total revenue generated by arcades is strongly correlated with the number of computer science doctorates awarded in the US. This one might actually be causal. But. Um, one of the examples used in the Clever Hans article is this paper, Probing Neural Network Comprehension of Na Natural Language Arguments by Timothy Niven and Hung Yu Kao. And it's a paper that came out relatively soon after BERT was first published. And it benchmarks on a, a you know, relatively unknown data set um, that the broader NLP community might not care that much about. And their initial result is just that BERT dramatically outperforms the existing alternatives. Um, most people at this point would say, great, the new tool works. We have a paper, let's publish it. Uh, these folks did not. They said, hmm, this works dramatically better than the existing stuff, why? And they spent a fair amount of time looking into reasons why BERT might be significantly outperforming their baseline here. And one of the things they found was that there were many high level statistics in this data set, which were strongly correlated with the, the result, um, but not at all causal. So for instance, the presence of the word not in the input determines the uh, correct answer 61% of the time. But so, sorry, uh, in 64% of the cases, the input has, uh, has the word not present. When the word not is present, the uh, correct answer is, I forget which class, but it's a predictor 61% of the time. It, it's quite strongly correlated with the end output, even though it's just a simple heuristic, like is the word not present or not? And they found many other similar examples of these kinds of spurious correlations in this data set. And one of their conclusions was basically, we need to be very careful about data set design if we're going to uh, accurately measure whether or not uh, new models are actual improvements or whether they're picking up on service level statistics um, that are actually undesirable present in the training data. And I think at this point in time, we have good evidence that Birch probably is doing more than picking up on just simple surface level statistics of data sets. Um, but there's nothing to enforce that is doing what we want. Um, BERT is, uh, you know, does not care whether it's solving the problem of interest. It's simply going to try and decrease its loss as much as possible. And if an effective way to decrease that loss is to pick up on this not heuristic, it sure as heck is going to pick up on that not heuristic. <laughs> it has quite a lot of parameters to uh, implement a not detector. Another one of my favorite papers in this space is a recent publication uh, that has the distinction of being one of the uh, papers with the longest author list I've ever seen um, called Underspecification Presents Challenges for Credibility in Modern Machine Learning. And they argue that these kind of surface statistics that are correlated with the output are not just bad data set design. They are uh, unfortunate realities of the kinds of problems we want to solve, even in cases where people have taken great care to make sure that their data distribution matches production, they still find variation from model run to model run. And they find that if you look at any particular slice of your test data set, performance on that slice might vary wildly between model runs. So in other words, the model is picking up on different features based on something as simple as a change in random seed at each training run and uh, performing well on a different subset of the overall data set. 
which is somewhat surprising. Um, the model has found multiple ways or in different instances of the same kind of model trained with different random seeds arrive at different local minima that have uh, performed well in different subsets of your data. So if we want to, hmm, interesting. This time I actually, I see the slide of interest uh, on my little preview, but I can try unsharing and resharing. When in doubt, turn it off and back on again. Um, yes, as I was saying, it's it's interesting that uh, same model architecture with a different random seed can result in uh, a dramatically different subset of data points that are handled well. And it's somewhat concerning. <laughs> So I wanted to talk a bit about some methods that are beginning to emerge that can help resolve this problem of not having a well-specified task. Um, and I think offer some higher bandwidth uh, communication interfaces than simple one hot labeled examples. The first is this concept of rationales. So instead of simply um, for a classification task, providing a classification target, we provide a classification target, and we provide the reason we made a classification decision. So here's a sentiment analysis task that I'm showing up on the screen. And I've gone ahead and I've highlighted uh, the most important phrases in this uh, example of interest with a green highlight to indicate that these are the positive phrases associated with this example. Um, when we provide a model with supervision like this, you know, obviously we have to change our loss to be able to take into account this additional supervision, but we get an idea of not only what decision was made, but why we why we made that decision. And I think this is actually, you know, a much higher bandwidth interface between human and machine learning model. And it shows in terms of how quickly we're able to learn to solve the task of interest. So this is from a paper called Combining Unsupervised Pre-Training and Annotated Rationales to Improve Low Shot Text Classification. Um, these are, you know, kind of noisy graphics, but on the left here, the yellow and gray lines represent models trained with rationales and the, on the right, the green and gray lines represent, uh, rationale models. So as you can see, especially here on the right, um, incorporating some, some notion of rationale is incredibly beneficial at low training data volumes, uh, where there, where these problems associated with specification are most uh, most problematic, simply because uh, a lot of patterns that hold with a small number of data points uh, might not hold with larger numbers of data points. So if we really want to continue to decrease the amount of labeled data required to solve these problems effectively, we need to focus on uh, increasing our ability to correctly specify the task of interest. Another fascinating approach is from Snorkel. Um, maybe some of you have used some of Snorkel's open source work. Um, they're now actually also a company in a similar space to Indico. And their key idea is communicating with machine learning models via notions of heuristics. So they, they, their big bet is that heuristics are more effective communication interfaces than labeled examples. And instead of, ident instead of uh, just specifying particular labels for particular examples, they want to allow labelers to also specify the basic rules that they use to make a decision. Importantly, these rules are not always effective. They're only effective on some subset of the data, but they are um, predictive in some small region of trust. So the way Snorkel works is you have a few labeling functions. You learn to model the scenarios where those labeling functions are effective. And then finally, you soft label. You use this generative model to label many unlabeled instances using a notion of where each heuristic is reliable. 
and train a discriminative model on a much larger data set. So this is a way to translate simple heuristics into large amounts of weakly labeled data that you can use as supervision. I think this is a really fascinating idea that warrants more exploration. Maybe my favorite example of uh, better methods for specifying tasks is this concept of pattern exploiting training by Tim Oshik. Um, if you are not familiar with Tim Oshik, um, I would really recommend following the, the line of research he's working on. I forget which university he's at, but he's a, a current PhD candidate. And I just think the stuff he's doing is fascinating. In particular, he's looking at um, using templates in conjunction with language models to turn, uh, I guess, discriminative tasks into to, uh, a framing where we can better make use of generative language models. So in this case, we have on the right uh, how typical fine tuning might work. We have some labeled examples and we're gonna produce a uh, and prediction of how likely we think this is a positive sentiment versus a negative sentiment. Here on the left, we uh, have an instance of pattern exploiting training. So our input here is best pizza ever. On top of that input, we append this little template, this little pattern. Uh, it was blank, period. And we uh, feed this into BERT. And we look at the relative probabilities of the term great and the term bad. And we find um, that the term great is assigned a much higher probability than the term bad. The logit is much larger. So even without any labeled training data, we can use the knowledge contained in this language model to make a classification decision simply by associating the term great with a positive sentiment and the term bad with a negative sentiment. And importantly, this requires exactly zero training data um, in this particular instance. They also have a means to, to use this in a semi-supervised fashion um, and many extensions to uh, generate weekly labeled data sets and go through several iterations and continue to improve the model quality. But the key concept here is just this zero shot uh, labeling idea of using a blank and a language model probability as a proxy for the task of interest. And this is much better defined than uh, the supervision that a model might get through labeled examples. And the difference is kind of striking. So here at 10 and 50 examples, we see gaps of 15 F1 points. In some cases, I think it's as extreme as about 35 F1 points at 10 examples on a Yelp sentiment analysis task. So it's absolutely massive. Um, some of their more recent work uh, focuses on this concept of, you know, many of the principles that work well for GPT-3 are also effective with simpler, smaller language models. Um, the same core concepts hold. Um, yeah, so here we can talk a bit about GPT-3 and some of the strategies they use. So um, GPT-3 is really focusing on this uh, framing of having a task description and a prompt. So we're trying to translate some task into a format that a language model understands. And purely by generating um, potential candidate outputs, we're solving the task of interest. So here, without any labeled training data, um, simply by looking at what terms the model generates, we're able to solve this translation task with some efficacy. You know, this is far from perfect, but it's also uh, not entirely garbage. <laughs> we also extend this to a scenario where you have a task description and a few examples, and uh, the model's learning to, to follow the format shown in previous lines to continue um, with a example we don't have a label for. So the task of the human in the system becomes to find good prompts, find good task descriptions that lead to good behavior when supplied unlabeled examples. So um, 
people are starting to think about this idea of prompt engineering, um, which might be manual, might be learned by a machine learning model, but how do we most accurately specify the task of interest to a machine learning model, uh, in particular a language model, through natural language? Similarly, here's a, uh, a multimodal model. This is a model trained to identify the most likely caption from a, a group of candidate captions for uh, a particular input image. So I think this is trained on a bunch of, of web scrapes where we have caption information associated with images. And here, simply by measuring uh, which caption has the highest probability, we can supply our own captions and get a zero shot classifier out the other end without supplying any additional label training data other than that which the model has already been exposed to through pre-training. So um, we're totally free to build our own classifiers simply by coming up with a set of description strings that we want the model to select between um, and taking the one with highest probability. So these are models that have been designed from scratch to work in this zero shot or few shot setting where we have very limited uh, amounts of label training data. We'll take a, a break from talking about specification and talk a bit about ML pain points. So I think these are some of the things that are uniquely um, problematic, uniquely challenging about deploying ML applications to production. And a fair amount of this is based on the paper, machine learning, the high interest credit card of technical debt. This is not uh, a, a very new paper. This is a paper that came out in 2014, but the concepts that this paper mentions are, are still incredibly relevant. The first concept they bring up is this idea of boundary erosion. Um, so in software, we talk about boundary objects. We talk about the interfaces between different pieces of a system. And good boundaries are well-defined. Um, one piece of software knows exactly what another piece of software is going to output. It knows the ways in which that, that little piece of information can vary. Um, it knows what's valid, it knows what's invalid. Machine learning is a bit different because we don't really have a great way to separate what is uh, a quirk of the data from something which is actually an invariant. And the argument this, this paper makes is this is one of the factors that really contributes to machine learning systems being hard to deploy, um, hard to use in production. It's the simple fact that it's hard to draw hard assertions about what outputs of machine learning systems can and cannot be. And there's always a possibility that we're going to get um, some undefined behavior. And we have to, to account for that. Um, and one of the side effects of this is that downstream systems which consume the outputs of machine learning models have many of the same problems that the machine learning models themselves have. Um, those downstream systems, it's hard to write code for if we can't uh, make hard assertions about the inputs we're receiving. The second problem is this of entanglement. In other words, Changing anything changes everything. So you see this both in modifying the input features of a machine learning model. Um, you might have features that are codependent um, or correlated. You also see this when you're chaining models together where the distribution of previous models impacts the behavior of downstream models. And having an upstream model's distribution change has downstream effects. So it's desirable to want to break up machine learning problems into nice, uh, easy to understand, easy to build components. But doing this in practice is actually quite hard because if you make a change to a model upstream, it's going to have impact on downstream models. You might find that a downstream model is actually correcting for some error mode of an upstream model. And in fixing that error mode of the upstream model, your downstream model is now underperforming because it's, it's no longer receiving the same uh, distribution of data that it was before. So we, we run into this problematic scenario where making any changes upstream requires propagating those changes all the way downstream. Um, 
especially when you're doing something like, um, let's say, this upstream classification model decides whether something is a possible instance of fraud or not a possible instance of fraud. And we make some change, and it means that more um, more texts are, are are being identified as fraud or spam, and we start feeding those to this key information extraction model, for instance, downstream, and it simply doesn't know what to do with them because it hasn't seen them before. We actually need to, you know, maybe just based on a hyperparameter change upstream, we're receiving a different distribution of information, and we might have to label more data points to allow this downstream model to adequately handle the upstream model's outputs. So ML pipelines are, are tightly coupled by default. It, it makes deployment difficult. And it makes management over time difficult. We also have this issue of distribution shift, uh, distribution shift or data drift. Um, so this is similar to a diagram we show our customers about what their performance expectation should be um, in deploying uh, machine learning models production. So, you know, transfer learning enables us to get up to speed pretty quickly. The fact that we're using pre-trained models means that small amounts of labeled data allow us to get to a reasonable point. Um, but we almost always see performance drop in production deployment. And the reason is often our customers don't have a good way of getting us a representative sample of the data they're seeing in production. It's surprisingly hard. I am just my mind is blown by how hard it is to get a random sample of data from production. Um, we almost always see that our samples weren't perfectly representative of production data streams. I see this initial drop. Um, then through some of the tools we've discussed earlier, we have this iterative development process where we're correcting for failure modes we observe, making model changes, and seeing improvements. We also have this effect that um, your, your initial data set is never going to be representative of how your data set might change over time. So data drifts, it wanders, and we need to adjust, be making kind of continuous adjustments as your incoming data stream changes. So quickly, this is an example from Scale AI. Um, this is an example of this production distribution shift. One scale customer, for example, found that their vehicle recognition algorithm didn't perform well in certain environments. It turned out that the model was trained on a data set where vehicles are mostly in the bottom of the image, so the model associated bottom of the image with likelihood of being a car. First of all, that's concerning, because presumably this is a driverless car company. Um, and you know, this seems like a fun, pretty fundamental problem. Um, but secondly, it's not surprising. <laughs> Things like this happen all the time, where um, maybe pre-processing operations that were applied to create a data set are, are not applied in production, or um, simply you're, you're getting data from different places that you weren't getting data from before, that have different characteristics. So this is, again, the norm, not the exception. Here's also an example of data drift in production um, from one of our customers at Indico. So one of Indico's responsibilities is to detect overfull uh, dumpsters for a waste pickup company. And we observed that um, our models were performing well on data from spring and summer, but performing poorly from uh, data during fall and winter. And we we're kind of curious what accounted for this performance gap. When it turns out, this was obstruction from snow and leaves. So there were leaves in our images, there was snow in our images that prevented us from being able to um, accurately classify whether or not a dumpster was ever full. And it's something you might not think about when you sample um, data from the past three months or something, that there's seasonality in your data. And different months have different characteristics that need to be um, accounted for in your data set. Finally, um, another problem that this machine learning, uh, the high interest credit card of technical debt paper calls out is this idea of dangerous positive feedback loops. Um, so this is actually an example I'm using straight from weapons of math destruction, how big data increases inequality and threatens democracy. This is a, a book by Kathy O'Neill. 
Um, and it's this predictive policing example where uh, police patrol, perhaps predominantly black areas, historic data gets used for predictive policing. The model recommends patrolling the same areas that have always been patrolled because that's where arrests are being made. Um, and more patrolling in those areas means more arrests are made. And we get this vicious cycle where the model is just reinforcing existing biases. Um, this is one thing I, I worry about a lot is that uh, machine learning models provide uh, or, or cause a certain kind of inertia where the data we produce today is going to be persisted or uh, it's going to be persisted through the predictions of machine learning models trained on that data. So even if our social norms, our cultural norms update, it might take a while if uh, much of our life is determined by machine learning models um, because they're going to continue to, to represent those existing biases um, unless action is taken to, to change the input data. So just another thing to, to be concerned with when deploying models to production. Uh, and finally, our last section, production deployment and beyond. This is a bit more optimistic. Um, so what are the unique affordances that production machine learning um, provides us with? In an academic setting, we're almost always operating in the scenario where you have some static data set you train a model on, and you have a single option in terms of your, your output. You just have to record your predicted class or record your predicted spans, what have you. In practice, we have many more options available to us. So yes, we can directly record the predicted class, but we could also do something like presenting uh, a human with a list of candidates, likely classes that we think um, can be narrowed down to the true class. We could fully fall back to a human if we decide that, you know, our model looks very uncertain. We're, we're producing very low probabilities on this particular example. We don't trust ourselves to be able to produce the right answer. Let's fall back to a human. We can also ask clarifying questions. We might set up a, a model in a way that, um, you know, we can ask point questions to narrow down the output space. And we can also say, we simply don't care about this, this input. You know, maybe this, this image is too blurry to be processed. Maybe it's too dark. Maybe it's too uh, backlit. We can't be expected to handle it for some reason. The data quality is just not high enough. So there are many more options presented to us rather than just recording the highest probability class. And importantly, um, we really don't necessarily care that much about accuracy. There are often better metrics to monitor than accuracy or than F1 precision recall. Um, metrics that are more aligned with how our stakeholders actually measure value. So one thing we're moving towards at Indico is measuring time on task um, in these data entry tasks, rather than metrics on the quality of each individual field. Because time on task translates directly to business value. You can do some, some basic math and turn time on task into a dollar figure. Um, the same is not true of F1 scores per class. ML should also be focusing on accuracy as well. And in combination with time on task, we're monitoring um, overall accuracy metrics, but I think it's, um, I think both are required. And uh, the thing that accuracy doesn't give us in a human in the loop setting is a measure of uh, how an accurate machine learning model actually translates to business value. I think it's like a minimum requirement rather than the thing to, to optimize for. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I guess we can talk a bit about interpretability. So in some settings, people talk about interpretability as kind of the path through a network to arrive at a decision. We're looking for like this node, this, this activation uh, activating highly or uh, something along those lines. But this is actually pretty far from what we should care about, I would, I would argue. We don't particularly need to know exactly how a model makes a decision. 
in order to be able to trust the model's outputs. So I think explainable AI is less necessary than trustworthy AI. Um, as humans, we totally trust people in our lives. We may not necessarily uh, understand the decision-making process, but their track record is enough to build our confidence in that person. We don't necessarily need to understand their decision-making process. Um, it helps, but it's not strictly necessary. So rather than focusing on building explainable AI, why don't we uh, decide to be more happy with black boxes, decide that um, not every prediction, not every task we want to solve can easily be broken down into you know, uh, some causal graph um, and just decide that if we can measure, we can establish trust in a machine learning system. I think this is harkening back to the earlier slide. So this is not necessarily accuracy, precision, recall, F1, IOU. It's necessarily tied to a business outcome. Um, so looking for things that are more like time to enter data. Um, and actually, instead of, instead of accuracy or precision or recall here, we do want to measure that the outputs are of sufficiently high quality. But we might do that by uh, recording the number of edits necessary to get to the uh, to the actual ground truth we'd like, rather than measuring something like accuracy or precision or recall. Edits necessary is something that translates more directly to business value. And I think it's important also to learn to speak the language of domain experts. Um, the number of times I have had to explain precision or recall or F1 scores or false positives or false negatives to domain experts is, is like innumerable at this point in time. Um, and very rarely is it effective. I've had a lot more success with learning the things that our domain experts care about and translating our metrics into something that they're familiar with. So I'll close by talking about a ACL 2020 best paper called Beyond Accuracy Behavioral Testing of NLP Models with Checklist. Um, and similar to the assertion I just made, if we need to establish trust in a machine learning model, how do we really establish trust? Um, and I would argue that we need more than a simple test split to build this trust. Um, and they would agree. <laughs> so what they've given us, again, they've used this, uh, this traditional programming analogy, and they've looked for analogs for practices in software engineering and translated them to the machine learning domain. So for instance, one common pattern is a unit test. We're testing that some basic functionality is present. Um, they call this a minimum functionality test. So here they've defined the simple sentence template, I uh, negation, positive verb, the thing. They have some uh, just basic dictionaries to select from for each of these uh, terms in this sentence. And uh, prior knowledge about what they should expect the outcome to be. So in this case, because we're negating a positive verb, we're always going to expect the outcome to be negative. Um, this is going to hold generally true. Uh, we can generate many examples that look like this that are all quite simple. Um, and they found that this particular model failed in 76% of cases. Um, so this is one way we might test the minimum functionality of a model. I mean, this is good because it's kind of a measure of generalization. Uh, you know, these, these examples don't necessarily have the exact same characteristics of the data in our training set, um, but they're incredibly simple examples. We would expect a model that is reliable on our training data to also function on examples this simple. And if they don't, we should be a bit concerned. <laughs> we should be worried that maybe the, instance for, the instances we're going to apply this model to, um, it won't be effective. In. A second uh, example is moving from uh, what we might call metamorphic testing in the software side to uh, invariance tests uh, in the machine learning setting. So metamorphic testing is all about testing uh, attributes of objects. Invariance tests are modifying attributes 
of an input example and asserting that modifying, uh, I guess, irrelevant details doesn't change the actual outcome. So in this case, we're changing uh, the uh, destination city for a flight. And you'd expect that changing the destination city for a flight does not significantly change the sentiment of your example. Changing this, this city is a relatively trivial operation to run because you know we can use lexicons to um, find instances of particular cities in our input text and to convert them to other cities. So it's very easy to generate data that looks like this. Um, and we have we can make a strong assertion that this should not realistically change the sentiment of the example. Um, but even here, we see that this trivial change caused failure in about 20% of cases. So that's a, a pretty, uh, that's the kind of measure of model health that we might want to monitor if we really are to build trust in our machine learning models. Um, so this means we're looking at a random sample of our training data set, yes, but we're also looking at critical slices. We're looking at subsets by time, subsets by attributes, um, looking at more detailed splits of our data set than simply a random sample of our training data or our, our, our data set. One final test they suggest is this directional expectation test, um, also an instance of metamorphic testing where we expect um, if we add more negative terminology, we should not increase the sentiment of a sentence. So tacking on these negative phrases at the end of a negative example should not make them more positive. Um, and if it does, we should be concerned. So here they also found that their example model failed this simple test in about 34% of cases. So I know this isn't quite uh, putting a ribbon on it. It's not quite tying things up, but hopefully the idea sample platter was interesting. Hopefully you got a couple um, papers to follow up on, a couple ideas that you might be able to implement in production. Um, and yeah, I guess my goal is just to jar some uh, interesting thoughts loose in people's brains. So um, would welcome any questions folks have Happy to talk more in detail about any particular element of the presentation. <laughs> That's all I've got. Hey, Madison. Thanks for uh, taking time. I think this was one of the most comprehensive end-to-end -end, uh, ML, how to build ML systems, uh, also grounded in a lot of theoretical work. Um, so thanks for taking time to do that. Um, I'll open the floor for any questions. Uh, I mean, there are quite a few uh, I have, so I will let uh, the audience pick one and then go from there. Um, so there's one that's come up. Madison, you are on mute. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so we actually considered Airflow uh, at Indico. We ended up building our own internal system, but uh, I looked at, did a brief look at Airflow 2.0 recently, and I really liked the direction it's gone. So if I were doing this again from scratch, I would probably go with Airflow. But uh, I think even, I haven't found a tool yet that kind of solves all of all of my wants for production ML deployment. I think right now it still feels like you have to cobble together many tools to get something effective out the other end. So um, one DB solves some of my uh, you know needs as a researcher, but it's less well suited to you know production model deployment. Airflow sounds uh, solves some of these pipelining needs, but um, as far as I know, it doesn't really help us with like data set model versioning as much as some other tools in the space. So still seems quite fragmented to me. Uh, 
Any other questions? Madison, early in the uh, session, um, you had essentially talked about, uh, you know, noisy data and, you know, challenges with labeling. Um, and, you know, I've been kind of following Snorkel and Google on a uh, lot of their work. Uh, you know, I don't think their papers really went mainstream in there. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of those them talked about is like, hey, you know, just kind of they bridge the gap between explainability and, you know, kind of finding the uh, data points, one that add to a lot of noise. Uh, so essentially you can remove them. Uh, and the other ones they talked about is, hey, you know, which are the uh, samples that are really contributing uh, positively to the model as well. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I have mixed success with both of them, uh, both in practice and, you know, uh, participating in some of the Kaggle competitions. What are, what are what has been your takeaway on some of those? I'm I'm kind of waiting and hoping, I'd say. So I have I've gone through some some toy problems at Indico with with Snorkel and had decent success, but um, mostly I would say that they have a great rep reputation. A lot of folks uh, who I respect are part of the Snorkel team now. Um, Aside from the Stanford Research Group, there's also uh, Chip Hewen. I'm, I'm not sure how to yeah, pronounce her yeah. last name, but uh, I guess one of the key figures in this, uh, in the production ML space. So I, for no other reason than their team, I trust them to build an, an awesome product. Um, and I really hope that their their uh, work pays off. Some yeah. of their, their um, testimonials look quite promising on their website, so. Yeah. I've been, I mean, Chip has also become like a TA back at Stanford as well. And she's, you know, yes. talking about similar topics uh, that uh, that you have mentioned here. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, let's see how that area pans out. I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of competitors around that as well. So I think there's one more question in from, um, you mentioned about 1DB. Is that correct? Uh, ah, so weights and biases. Okay. I'm pretty sure most people know it as weights and biases. The okay. website is wandb.com, <laughs> so we end up referring it to as one db. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other it's more research scenarios, though? I'd say rather than production. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, I would let Madison go. I guess it's pretty early in the morning for you. So I really appreciate you spending time. Uh, thanks for uh, taking time and, uh, you know, making space. Of course. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I might, uh, I might go back to sleep, in all honesty. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks, man. Take it easy. Have a good one.